All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, this first demo, I guess, is my fault. <laughs> Let's start that way. Uh, I'm a huge Mule fan, and uh, I recently found out about uh, a project that actually is, uh, has been going on here in Toronto, actually, which has been awesome. And that is the remake of Mule, uh, as in Mule Returns. And so I contacted uh, Matt uh, at the company, and he's here to uh, bring you up to speed on where we're at with um, your world turns. So, uh, welcome so, back. So, um, what I wanted to uh, tell you guys about is a little bit about how we got here. For you know how we, you know, what, why did we pick Mule? What was the journey like to get the license? And some of the challenges that we've run into uh, as we've been developing the game. Um, we are uh, targeting early 2013. We have an internal beta. Um, that I have on an iPad. It's someone's brave enough to uh, to take a look at it, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about uh, you know what what's still not right there uh, with what we have. So so why mule? Again, I'm I'm probably speaking to the converted here, so not much introduction required. Um, but mule has been hailed as one of the more influential games of all time. It's thought to be the grandfather of not only modern strategy games but also some of the modern genres uh, around turn-based strategy and some of the real-time strategy components. Um, it is actually a deep game. If, uh, if any of you are familiar with, uh, Will Wright sometimes talks about emergence, uh, if any of you are familiar with the concept. The idea is, is that you take a game that's relatively simple, it has a simple set of rules, but as you play it, it ends up being much deeper than its rules allow. So Go is the best example of a game like that. It really has two or three rules, but yet the game strategy behind it is extremely deep and, you know, the game's 700 years old or more and so on. So same, same idea here is that perhaps on the outset it's relatively straightforward, but as you begin to play, you realize it's not just about trading resources. You, can, you know, for those of you who have played the game, you realize you can, like, buy mules and let them run free to make it more difficult for other players to play it further around. So there's interesting things you can do to manipulate the game. Um, it was really one of the first successful multiplayer games. They thought of it as, I think they called it a party game for a while, you know, that you could plug in four joysticks and off you could go with a, with a bunch of friends. Um, and, uh, and to this day, when we started remaking it, obviously we, you want to know where the biggest market for Mule is in the world? What country? The U.S.? No. Korea? No. India? Germany. Germany. Oh, I was going to say Germany. 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 But, but unfortunately, because of stereotypes. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, yeah, there was a joke once about the uh, about the Germans. There's a stand-up comedian saying, you know, uh, Germans are thought to be very analytical. And that's not true. Let me tell you the reasons. Number one. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, it's, it's got, so yeah, that's the, that's the biggest market. And so ironically, when, when we started announcing the game and we got um, feedback from Germany, it was, it was all about um, what they wanted to do once we had the launch date nailed. was actually hold parties. Because this is one of those things in theory you could sit side by side and play with each other. So um, playing to that idea of uh, first successful game. Uh, one of the first games published by Electronic Arts, did anyone know Don Daglow in the room or the name? No, the name. So he's, uh, he was one of the original publishers of Electronic Arts. Trip Hawkins hired Electronic Arts. He started his own studio called Stormfront Studios. He's one of our advisors. He's been helping us out. Uh, so, so we got to talk to him about really what happened at Electronic Arts in those early days. And so they, they bought, more or less they released games in batches at the beginning. So it was, I think, batch number one of all of the games that, uh, that they produced. Um, and, and of course, all of the uh, accolades that go with it. Piece of World, uh, uh, Noted Mule is number five on their list of, of top games. Um, it's, uh, you know, Will Wright loves the game. He dedicated The Sims to, to uh, Dan Button. Um, he also, uh, there's a, an Easter egg in Spore, uh, if you play that, that actually plays the theme, which is, which is a neat thing. Fine. So, so this is why Mule. I mean, this is a. This was, you know, not only is it a, was it a personal thing, right? No, it's kind of a one, or, one or two games that kind of defined our childhood, but uh, but also it, I mean, it was a very influential title. Um, so, so the game was released um, 
in a number of different platforms. Uh, the original 1983 was Atari 400, Atari 800, and the Commodore 64 shortly thereafter. Um, there was an IBM PC Junior version, if any of you are collectors, if you can find that, that is worth a lot of money. There's on record only one copy out there still that someone was able to find. That's the middle screen here. Um, if you go on YouTube, you can find this video of, of uh, Mule on PC Junior, which is fairly amazing. Uh, sometime in 1990, there was also an, an, an NES version of the game. Not as successful, and frankly, the execution was kind of poor. If you see the way the game plays, it's actually, I think it's worse than all the other versions. Um, in uh, 1996, there was a Son of Mule that was, uh, that was a concept. Um, and uh, so it was written up, and we were lucky enough working with Melanie Button, who's Dan Button's daughter, to get the documentation for Son of Mule, with some of the things that Dan had thought for, for the sequel. Um, we did incorporate actually one of his ideas, which is during the development round, all the players go at the same time. That was one of those thoughts in Mule 2, amongst others. Mule 2 was going to be kind of like a game show, was the idea. Um, but it was a concept only. 1998, uh, Dan, Danny at the time was working on Internet Mule when she passed away. Um, but uh, that would have been the next thing, and apparently that documentation exists uh, elsewhere as well. So hopefully in 2013, we're hoping to continue the tradition with Mule Returns. <laughs> These are the licensed licensed copies. There were uh, a whole bunch of knockoffs out there. There's Horse, there's... Uh, uh, actually, one of the licensed one that you may uh, be aware of is Planet Mule, which is an internet-only uh, version that was uh, done by a German team. It's actually, actually also a very well-executed uh, uh, variation of, of the game. I say variation because uh, they, they nailed the interface, they reverse engineered a lot of the AI, so it's close. Uh, we tried to do a little bit better on that, I'll tell you. Uh, Is that the same guys who did Space Meal? Uh, I don't know. Germans. Uh, <laughs> Um, so this is uh, this is cool as we were as we were looking through a bunch of documents uh, that uh, uh, Melanie, the licensor, was kind enough to send us. We found this. This is the, uh, the last page of the original Mule contract between uh, Trip Hawkin and Dan Bunton, signed in uh, 1982. So I thought that was that was pretty cool. Um, and so uh, type of media discuss. <laughs> so it's, uh, uh, this was this was this was cool. This was revolutionary. This was one of those early games. So 2013 really will be the 30 year anniversary of Mule and of Electronic Arts, um, as it happens. So some of our journey. Um, we talked to Ozark Softscape, which was you know the, which was the company that originally made it in 2011. They were in some negotiations at the time. Um, the contract began in 2012, and, and uh, I say beat out Electronic Arts to get the license. That negotiation didn't go so well. We came in at the right time and, and uh, were able to get the license before the EA deal was, was finalized, so we got lucky. Um, we're developing for iOS, uh, all flavors post 3GS, and the 3GS is working as a flu pattern. I'm surprised it actually works on it, but it does. Actually, the iPad 1 is the hardest one to work on, so that's what we always test on. Because if it works on the iPad 1, it's probably going to work on everything else. Uh, we're, we're doing Android at the same time. Uh, that's the compatibility there. I'll have to we'll have to figure out as we go. Any plans for a desktop? After all of this, yes, we're on license for mobile right now. So hopefully, if this goes well, we'll continue and we'll port from there. So we're developing in C++ again for the purposes of portability. If should we want to go somewhere else, uh, using a, a middleware framework that I can't explain to you, unfortunately, because I'm not the developer. Um, but for those of you, that means that has something. So we're, we're targeting early 2013. Um, we did have, uh, and this is this is one of those things you learn. You know, this is my first game, so this is what I learned about putting dates out there for games, especially. So we had said November this year. So now I'm trying to figure out, you know, how we take the foot out of the mouth and uh, and, and uh, keep going. One of the other things that's happening is we're speaking with the publisher right now, which is also making extending the process. So. We'll see. Stay tuned. Um, our approach overall was to keep the thing very, game very faithful. I think there was a lot of cool things in the original, and we want to keep them as much the same as possible. So, um, from a from a graphics perspective, again, we wanted to sort of get inspired by the original, but not really go too far. I'll show you a trailer at the end with all of the stuff moving and animated. And if you do check out our website, 
I have animations of all the characters on there, some screenshots so you can get an idea of how it works. We're lucky enough to get, um, our art director is a, uh, Gem a Gemini award-winning uh, animator who used to be used to work for Disney and now for Forest, so he does some pretty amazing stuff, uh, so we're lucky to have him. Uh, so we want to be original uh, to that. We also want to be original, uh, faithful to the original gameplay. So we traced most of the 8-bit code, uh, the original 8-bit code. That was part of my job. That was exciting. Um, it, uh, I say most. I would want to say all, but no. I, you know, at some point, it just became a little too tedious uh, to, to look at. I'll show you some examples later. Um, so we originally, what we did is we actually took all the original screens in the order they appeared, in the way that the game interacted, and put it on the iPad. Um, it didn't work. It, it just it didn't it didn't play anymore. It did. When you have it on a touch device, and the expectations of users are a little bit different. You know? So if I gave it to one of the younger members of our audience here, and I gave you the game, you continue to try to swipe the screen or do something, but it doesn't do anything, right? In the original, you wait, you watch things happen. <laughs> so it didn't necessarily translate. So we had to, we have to have the ability to skip a screen, right? If you're tired of watching things move, you just hit the screen and it goes to the next one. Uh, it's a mobile game, we have to add a pause button now, uh, which, you know, some can say violates parts of the original game. Unfortunately, you know, you can't. You have to have it on, on a mobile game. Um, very control options. You can point, you can drag your, your characters. The only thing we're opposed to is a D-pad. And then if you have a touch device, you can't have a D-pad. Even though we did put some arrows on the auction screen just for fine adjustment, uh, but they're, which work fine on an iPad, but on an iPhone, it's a little more difficult. Um, have all players develop their plots at the same time. You, again, if you remember the game, you go buy your land, and then each player would take their turn going and developing their land, which just made it all happen at the same time, primarily for multiplayer. So this is, uh, we have multiplayer 90% complete, and for that to work really well across multiple devices, you really need that to happen at the same time for the game to kind of maintain its pace. We would redesign the score screen. Um, we're redesigning the production screen, so, so again, I'll show you in the uh, trailer what it does today. Again, we're thinking it needs to be something a little bit more um, modern, but still keeping to the whole idea of the strategy. Um, and we'll likely add uh, some sort of summary screens of what the players hold at any given point in time, because they're hut a little bit small. Uh, so to give you an idea, this is our store screen. Um, and the idea being, these are... All the players will go at the same time. We have a time bar above each player that tells them how much time they have. We're still going to clean up the time bar, make it a little nicer. If there's a food shortage, it'll give you a little icon above your player telling you there's a food shortage of the time. Either goes down faster or is smaller. Uh, our HUD, we're also changing a little bit, but still we're going to keep very little data on it because, again, if you think about this on an iPhone screen, it has to be big enough for you to see what's going on. Um, so, because the HUD screen is small, we need some way of showing you what all the other players have. Again, that's, that's part of the strategy. So the idea being is you'll have a pull-down screen that tells you where everybody sits. Um, and then hopefully that, that gives you the, the overall feel for the strategy of the game. Music. This was interesting. I had no idea music could be so polarizing. Uh, so we took the original and we created, uh, and you'll hear this in the trailer, so I won't belabor this one, but we created kind of a, a techno-electronica version of it. And again, trying to keep it relatively original, but... And this played with more, most audiences quite well. But then just to be, a, it, it, to be a little more creative, we went out and found a bassoon quartet out of Texas um, that were really cool uh, and asked them to remix the theme. And I, I, I think this is fantastic. Um, when the licensor heard this, I got a phone call two minutes later saying, I'm pulling your license. Well, I don't like the foghorns. And, uh, and, and I completely empathize because you right. I mean, the, my mistake, I actually didn't clear it first. Um, but uh, but it didn't you know it didn't really play with everybody. It really divided the audience to such an extent that I had to go out and we have a mailing list on our website. So I emailed everyone and said, please, you know, here's a short survey, monkey survey. Can you tell me which one you like? Because I I don't know. I, I like both. But so the original was liked by 90% of the audience, and the bassoon version was was liked surprisingly uh, by 70% of the audience. So that was nice. But I mean, you tell me what you think. I think it's <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
questions. Yes, sir. Will you take gameplay questions at this point? Yeah. yeah. So the, the pause, um, in a multiplayer setting, obviously you can have anybody pause, and the phone can pause if a call comes in. So what is the effect on the other player? Um, we're thinking about that. Okay. Uh, we, because we've cr we're going to create all of the AI um, for the entire game, one of the options is this switches to AI. Call from the other player just kind of stops. The AI takes over and goes off and does what the AI would. Um, that's one of the options. Um, we do have. We're also the, the think about the concept of timers. So you have so much time before something happens, and then you continue. Uh, but this is. I mean, this is the same problem any multiplayer game has on the phone. Curious. Is either you drop completely out of the game, which we don't really want to do, uh, or something takes over for you. So we're, we're going to play with that and see how it, see how it works. But pa pausing everybody in the game is not an option. Here. Not really, no. Uh, even for things like when you get to choose, you know, when you're within an auction, you're trying to choose whether you're a buyer or a seller, all of those things become timed. So you choose one or the other, but the, there's a time, there's a countdown of five. This is the nice thing. Once with the countdown, and we can kind of tweak the timing, but, you know, three to five to ten seconds for you to choose, and then it just defaults to you being a buyer. I'll show you this and then. So this is the same thing that's on YouTube if any of you have seen that. Cities of Gold. Um, again, that's one of those games that played really well at the time. And, you know, the, the, the algorithm in it to create um, dynamic continents, for example, was amazing at the time. They created these planes and they would shift the planes to create what looked like randomly shaped continents. Um, you know, by today's standards, it's just, that's, you know, you can, you can write that in, in four lines. Um, the game kind of played like an exploration game. I think it can be adapted. I think there's some cool things you can do with it. So we're thinking about it. We're thinking about that, but uh, no, no. There's also constraints with this type of game. Every time we make a change to music, to character, you know, there's a flood of feedback. I was saying, this is fantastic, or you ruined the game. You know, so so there's a bit of you know there's constraints with some trying to remake something where you want to be faithful or not. So we'll, we're, we're debating. All right. Thank you very much for having me.